I'd like to address quickly here um, what is called the pretended neutrality fallacy and the fallacy of reification. Um, my friend Neil, uh, who is, seems like a, a gentleman, um, now that we've uh, you know corresponded a little bit more, he shared some of his story with me. I, I you know believe he's my brother in Christ, and um, I want to try to to address some of the issues here. There's a real problem, and I see this in Neil. I've seen it in many, 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 many other people uh, over the years that I've tried to help uh, come to a biblical worldview and to abandon the secularist worldview. That that problem is the pretended neutrality fallacy. The pretended neutrality fallacy. Uh, Jesus said that he who is not for me is against me. He who is not for me um, is against me. And there is no neutrality with God. Um, another fallacy that often happens that Neil committed numerous times in our correspondence is the fallacy of reification. Um, he reified science. Anytime you hear someone says, well, science says that the earth's billions of years old. <laughs> That's the fallacy of reification. Um, science can't say anything because science is not a personal being. Okay, science is a method of studying the universe. Science doesn't say anything. What he would have to say, not, well, science tells us this, as if science is just this neutral thing out there that people do and you just gotta follow the facts wherever they go. That is not the case at all, okay? You, could, you would have to say, some scientists say the universe is billions of years old or that the Earth's 4.5 billion years old and so on and so forth. But science doesn't say anything because science is not a person scientists say certain things. And why do they say certain things and not other things? Why is it that two scientists can look at the exact same thing, the exact same thing, and come to completely different conclusions? It is based wholly and completely upon what their starting points are. That determines the way they interpret everything. And so I want to say this. Your worldview determines what you take to be a fact. It determines what you take to be plausible explanations of facts. It determines what you take to be in need of an explanation. Your worldview determines what you take to be problematic about a situation. I'd like to give you two examples of how scientists who are atheists are not scientific at all. And they're not doing science at all. Two examples. Number one is the theory of the Oort cloud. Jan Oort was his name. You see, comets pose a major problem. The fact that they exist is a major problem for an old universe because comets have very short lifespans. They go around the sun a few times and then they, they burn out. They are losing their mass very rapidly as they fly through space. And so if everything's billions of years old, there should not be comets. There should not be comets anywhere in the universe that we can see. We should not be able to see hale Bop, and we should not be able to see Halley's Comet and all the other ones that we know about. So the atheist regiments his thinking based upon his worldview. And so now we have an entire theory called the Oort cloud. What is an Oort cloud? It is an undetectable, an undetectable rim of potential comets that exists outside of our solar system. And occasionally, for reasons unknown to anyone, since no one's ever seen the Oort cloud, no one's ever detected it. In fact, it's defined as, as being undetectable by present instrumentation. For reasons unknown to us, occasionally it throws a comet into orbit around the sun. I have a question, Neil. Is that science? Is that science? Does science tell us there's an Oort cloud? No, because it can't be seen, can't be detected, and arbitrarily, it just throws comets into the solar system once in a while. What is that? That's an argument from lack of data. That's called doing philosophy and calling it science. That's not science at all. No one's ever seen an Oort cloud. In fact, it's defined as being undetectable. Well, isn't that convenient? What's their rescuing device for the existence of comets? Well, since everything has to be old, everything must be billions of years old, and we will not even allow the possibility that anything other than that is true. Ah, oh, well, there's a source of comet somewhere. Well, has anyone ever seen it? No. Has anyone ever seen any evidence of its existence? No. Can you see any evidence of its existence? No. Why do you believe it's there? Because the universe has to be old, and there has to be a source of comets that fits our time scale. You see, that's why you can't say, well, science tells us this and science tells us that. No, it doesn't. Science doesn't tell you anything. Scientists 
tell you things based on how they interpret the facts and how they interpret the facts to fit their worldview. The Oort cloud is a perfect example of that very thing. Well, given our presuppositions about an old universe, the existence of comets doesn't make sense. So we will literally make up out of thin air on the basis of nothing anyone's ever seen, the Oort cloud. So don't tell me science tells us this and science tells us that. Science doesn't say anything. Science is not a person. Okay, the other theory that is one of my favorites is Stephen Jay Gould's theory of punctuated equilibrium. I remember hearing about this when I was younger um, and thinking, are you serious? Okay, Stephen Jay Gould, okay, world-renowned paleontologist, recognizes that the fossils that we have are no friend of the idea of evolution. Because when you see animals and when you see their bodies, you do not see um, transitions. You don't see anything on its way to becoming something else. Uh, you see a lot of things that are extinct, um, but when you see a horse, it's already a horse. When you see birds, they're already birds. You know, are Archaeopteryx and Tiktaalik. Oh, wait, Tiktaalik, that doesn't work because it was found in rocks that are dated a lot older than it's supposed to be, so that, that doesn't really work either. Archaeopteryx, well, it's, it turns out it's, it's a bird. People have been desperate to find transitions. There are none. Stephen Jay Gould recognized, look, fossils are no friend of the theory of gradual micromutational neo-Darwinian evolution. The fossils do not support this. So what did he come up with? Punctuated equilibrium. Let me explain the theory. Well, since evolution has to be true, since there's no God, and we've got to account for all the diversity of life that we see, uh, we'll postulate that evolution took place in real quick bursts, punctuated bursts of evolution. All of a sudden, huge changes happening really, 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 really fast, that are so fast, they don't leave behind any fossil evidence at all. And then, then you have long periods of equilibrium. And then it's punctuated by huge bursts of evolution. And there's, it happens so fast that, that no, no fossils are left behind. And then you have a period of equilibrium. Neil, is that science? Or is that philosophy? Is that scientific? Punctuated equilibrium. It was taught as science to me. In fact, we were taught in sixth grade that two lizards got together and laid an egg and a sparrow was born. The hopeful monster theory. In the absence of evidence, science engages in science fiction. The scientists who are atheists engage in science fiction. Why? Because God's not allowed to exist. He's not allowed to exist. So we'll come up with theories that have no evidence at all in order to rescue our presuppositions. That's why I said a person's presuppositions are not just, you know, it's just, you know, sort of picked out of thin air. They are personal commitments that have the highest immunity to revision. And so when people who are quote unquote atheists and who are scientists or agnostics or whatever, once they've embraced the deep time scale, you can show them facts all day long, and they're going to come up with rescuing devices, even if there is no evidence of any kind, no observable evidence whatsoever for these theories. The Oort cloud, any observable evidence, any scientific evidence? No. Is it believed in? Yeah. Well, why would people believe in it if there's no evidence for it? Because the Earth's not allowed to be young. Because the universe is not allowed to be young. That's my presupposition. That's my worldview. It is immune to revision. Facts have nothing to do, nothing to do uh, with what I believe. And you see, they don't have anything to do with what people believe in general. What determines what we believe is our presuppositions and our worldview. So don't tell me, well, science tells us the universe is this old. Uh, no, it doesn't. That's the fallacy of reification. You've reified science. You could say some scientists say that. Um, punctuated equilibrium. Here you have an argument to bolster a theory based on lack of evidence. Is that science or is that philosophy? Very clearly, it's philosophy masquerading as science. It is a pre-commitment uh, to the idea that there cannot be a God. There must not be a God. And of course, as I said, the, the God of evolution is really time. Time is, is the, the altar before which they genuflect, bow, and, and offer themselves as a living sacrifice. Because time is magical. It's magic. Give it enough time, pile on mutations, even though we've never seen one that adds information. Um, pile on the mutations and you'll get from amoebas to, here I am, as Bill and I said, Ken, Ken Ham, you want the evidence for evolution? Look at me, I'm sitting right here in front of you. We evolved. What, what's the, what does that show? 
It's a worldview issue. It has nothing to do with facts, nothing to do with science. Oh, they call it science, sure. But you see, I know what science is and what it is not. What they call science, when people say, yeah, the Oort cloud, that's a scientific uh, theory. No, it's not. It's a theory based upon a worldview for which there is no evidence whatsoever. None. Punctuated equilibrium. That is an argument to bolster the theory of evolution based on a lack of transitional fossil evidence. Well, I guess evolution, since it has to be true, it must have happened in huge, uh, real quick bursts that, didn't, that happened so fast it didn't leave behind fossils. Neil, is that science? Is that science telling us something? No, that's scientists who have an irrational worldview that destroys the possibility of even doing science. And I've noticed, Neil, you've avoided the philosophical questions that Bertrand Russell brought up. I sent you a link to the video where Russell admits we have no basis to believe in the uniformity of nature, no basis to believe in the validity of inductive reasoning, no basis to believe that the future will be like the past. Russell himself says, all we know is that in the past, the futures resembled the past. So we know that past futures have resembled past pasts, but we still don't have any rational foundation to proceed into the future believing that the future will resemble the past in terms of its law-like qualities. Do you have an answer for Russell? Does the atheist worldview have an answer for, for Russell, for Hume, for Hume's skepticism regarding causality? Do you have an answer for him? I've never heard one. Russell never came up with one. In fact, I've never heard any philosophers, Dawkins, any of them, scientists. You have an answer to the problem of induction, the problem of the uniformity of nature, the problem of the law-like characteristics of matter, chemistry, physics, holding true into the future. Why should we proceed on the expectation that they will? I know why. Because God created the world and governs it by his providence, and he gave man the task to subdue it. We wouldn't be able to do it if the universe was not uniform. Also, in Genesis chapter 8, he made a promise to Noah that seed time and harvest, summer and winter, would continue until the end of the world. I know the future will resemble the past because God told me it will. If you reject the Bible, you have no reason to do science. And yet, for some reason, atheists just keep right on doing science. Even though their worldview, if true, would render science impossible. And so what do they show? In their heart of hearts, they're not atheists. Here's what I would expect. If the Bible's true, which it is, I would expect to see lots and lots and lots and lots of people screaming through gnashed teeth, there is no God, and yet they live as if there is one. They expect you to know about moral absolutes. They expect you not to shoot them and take their things. They expect you to believe in the validity of inductive reasoning and the validity of scientific observations, the validity of rational discourse, the validity of laws of logic, the validity of the, the law-like characteristics of nature, even though their atheistic worldview destroys the very foundation of all of those things. See, when I read Russell's book, Problems in Philosophy, many years ago, I just kept writing in the margin, incredible admission. Incredible admission. And I posted that video. Bertrand Russell taking atheism like a man. Because he does. He gives away the store. He admits we don't have any reason to do science. <laughs> We're just going to keep doing it, though. But philosophically speaking, we have no, no rational foundation for it at all. And so the only response I've ever gotten from the other side is, oh, so you think God did it? God created the world and upholds it by his governing providence. That's what gives form and structure to our existence. That's what makes our experience intelligible. And so, Neil, I want to encourage you to uh, get a hold of uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism and memorize it. This idea that man is just neutral, that he just, hey, these scientists, they're just following the facts wherever they lead. Um, you know, I had a friend who was, uh, you know, a chemist, uh, never really had thought much about worldview types of issues. And he said, look, the scientists are just saying that the old ages is a, is a plausible explanation of the facts. And I pointed out to this, this very bright fellow, I said, don't, but don't you see that what a person lists in the, in the list of plausible explanations is going to be dramatically limited by their worldview? Don't you see that? Let me give you another example. Many years ago, William Lane Craig, who's a Christian apologist, debated a chemist named uh, Peter Atkins. He's, I think he's at Cambridge or Oxford, one of those things. He's a very outspoken atheist. Now, during the armchair discussion that followed, William F. Buckley was moderating it. And William Lane Craig is probably the greatest living expert on defending the historicity of the resurrection of Christ. Just phenomenal. And he made a devastating presentation um, on the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And William F. Buckley asked the atheist sitting there in the armchair, you know, Dr. Atkins, what did you think of, of Dr. Craig's presentation on the resurrection of Christ, of those facts that, that um, they, the, the disciples claim to be eyewitnesses of this, that Joseph of Arimathea, I mean, even the most radical liberal skeptics admit that these are facts. 
The disciples all claimed to have seen him after he was crucified alive. The, the, he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Um, how do you account for these, these historical facts? They went out and preached and died for, for this. How do you account for this? And Atkins said, Here's the, here are my uh, possible explanations. One, the disciples were liars. Two, they were hallucinating. Did you notice what's missing from the list of possible explanations? That he actually rose from the dead. Well, why is that even listed in the, that's not even, doesn't even show up as an option. Because his worldview doesn't allow it. And Craig pointed that out immediately. He said, notice, notice what's missing from the realm of plausible explanations here. That Christ actually rose from the dead. It's not even on the table. Why? Because that's not allowed to happen. Based upon that man's worldview. So don't you see that a person's worldview determines everything. Their interpretation of everything is determined by their starting points. Don't buy the pretended neutrality fallacy. And the late Dr. Greg Bonson said, look, when it comes to neutrality, Christians, you need to understand this when you're talking to non-believers. When it comes to neutrality, they aren't and you shouldn't be. They aren't neutral and you shouldn't be. Are they going to tell you they're neutral? Yes. But we know they're not. We know they're not. Will they tell you, I'm just going with the facts. This is just what the facts say. Facts don't speak for themselves. That's why I, I object to the reification of science. Well, science tells us this. No, it doesn't. Scientists tell us certain things based upon the way they interpret facts. And so you've got to get that. If you don't get that, you're never going to understand what God said in Genesis 3.15 is the enmity, the God-ordained antithesis between those who love and know the true God and those who do not. And so I hope that this has illustrated the pretended neutrality fallacy and also pointed out that scientists who are atheists, um, very often what they propose uh, for us to believe has nothing to do with facts, nothing to do with observations, nothing to do with science. They make hypotheses based on their worldview, not observations. The Oort cloud. Why is that even on the table? Not because anyone saw it, but because, well, we have to come up with a way to explain comets. And so they'll make up stuff. That's not science. That's science fiction. Same thing with punctuated equilibrium. What's the punctuated equilibrium? Evolution must be true. The fossils are not helping us. Okay, fine. Then evolution must have taken place in such a way that it doesn't leave behind any evidence. <laughs> and you just think, wow. Um, yeah, presuppositions are held at a personal level. Presuppositions and a person's worldview are not testable by science. They are rather that by which individuals interpret science, interpret facts. And so, Neil, until you get that, you're always going to be uh, hamstrung by this old earth stuff. You've already admitted, yeah, I get it. You know, if dinosaurs died out 65 million years before man even got here, you have death before sin, but I'm just nobly going with the facts. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're bowing to people who are in rebellion against God and who worship deep time as if it is their God. And you're acting like they're just being neutral. They're not neutral. They're not neutral. They hold time, deep time, to be God. And time, deep time, is absolutely immune to revision. And until you see that, you're always going to be stuck in these compromised positions. I want to invite you to abandon them and to embrace the biblical Christian worldview. Thanks for watching.